Okay, this is a picture of lead poisoning that comes from your textbook that shows the different systems that are most impacted by it. The hemat hematologic system, because uh, it interferes with with the production of heme groups, and which that then leads to anemia. It interferes with the renal system. It damages the cells, uh, causes this glucose urea, protein urea, ketone urea, changes calcium absorption, which also is vitamin D, interacts with vitamin D, and you end up with um, renal problems, and then the neurologic system. This being the most severe one, it increases membrane permeability, so that allows fluid to shift from intravascular out into the interstitial. That includes moving uh, the lead out into the tissues. Um, by moving fluid and, and those things that are dissolved in the, the water, uh, body fluid, out into the brain, you get increased intracranial pressure. That prevents the blood flow to the brain or decreases it, so you get tissue ischemia. You can end up with uh, atrophy of the brain or just little infarcted areas. Low dose exposure, you're going to eventually will lead to things like distractibility, impulsivity, hyperactivity, which that's the description of ADHD right there. can also affect hearing and cause mild intellectual deficits. At very high levels, you get lead encephalopathy, and this causes mental retardation, paralysis, blindness, convulsions, coma, and death. Moving on to child maltreatment, this can be uh, intentional physical abuse or neglect, emotional abuse or neglect, and then sexual abuse. We'll first look at types of neglect. Neglect is the most common of the problems here. Physical neglect means depriving a child of food, of clothing, of shelter, of supervision, of medical care, and or of education. It can be all of those or some of those. Emotional neglect is lack of affection and attention and emotional nurturance, so not giving the child what they need in those emotional areas. Physical abuse is deliberately inflicting physical injury on a child. Emotional abuse is deliberately destroying or impairing the child's self-esteem or feelings of competence. Shaken baby syndrome. This is um, a very sad thing. Usually it happens when a child is a parent, I mean, is frustrated with a crying child and they just kind of reach their limit and they shake the kid. Um, every year in the U.S., 1,200 to 1,400 children are shaken. 25 to 30 percent of these children will die. The, what happens, infants have a very large head. Remember, their head's large for their body size. The muscles in their neck are not very strong, so that head really swings back and forth farther than the body because the neck muscles aren't keeping it steady with the body. It's swinging more, more wildly than the body. And we said babies have more water. They're just comprised of more water, so you've got a lot of fluid, which is very heavy, so you've got all that weight, those weak neck muscles, and basically the brain, with all that weight inside of it, slams up against the skull in the front, and then it swings to the back, and it slams against the back skull. And this causes tearing of little blood vessels and of the neurons which can cause intracranial bleeding. It can be just small um, spots all over the place or you can tear something larger and have a larger area of bleeding. And then you get retinal hemorrhages. And this is small little pinpoint hemorrhages on the retina in the back of the eye. And that's pretty characteristic of shaken baby syndrome. You really don't get those pinpoint retinal hemorrhages from anything else. Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Uh, this has been in the news not recently, but over the last few years it's really been brought uh, to the attention of people. This is where a parent, and usually it's a mother, 
fabricates the signs and symptoms of an illness in her child and she's doing it for gaining attention herself from the medical staff. Um, the parent will do things to make the child truly look ill, to make the staff believe them, and about 10% of the time the ch it will be fatal. The things that the parent's doing to make it look like a serious illness will actually kill the child. There are some factors that it predispose are predisposing to physical abuse. Now realize these are not absolutes. You can have abuse in any set setting, I mean any um, location, any socioeconomic, you know, there, there is no, you know, guarantee that you won't see abuse um, regardless of what your patient is like or what their family's like. But these are the most likely, the predictors that you're most likely to see abuse. It's parents who were severely punished themselves. That's what they learned and that's what they then do to their children. Parents who have difficulty coping with stress and they have poor anger control. They, you know, lose it and then they overreact and hurt their child. Parents are socially isolated. They don't have good support systems. They don't have someone they can call and say, I got to get away for a couple hours, the kids are driving me crazy. The parents were often um, children of teenage mothers themselves, which is usually an indication that they did not, that they were not well parented and they didn't learn good parenting skills and now they're trying to use those inadequate parenting skills to parent themselves. And uh, the parents have low self-esteem and less adequate maternal functioning. Characteristics that we're going to see of children who are more likely to be abused, and again, it's not an absolute, but most of the time we'll see that the child is three or less, so from birth to age three, there's often an incompatibility between the child's temperament and the parent's temperament. So the child does not react to things the way the parent does, and the parent doesn't know how to deal with that. They're, you know, unaware of and just don't understand their child's temperament and behaviors. If you remove the child who's a victim from the house, often the parent will um, just turn to the other children's and another sibling will be abused. And usually it is a single child who's receiving the majority of the abuse, so taking that one away, uh, the parent still doesn't have adequate coping skills and they take it out on someone else, so usually all the children will be removed, not just the, the abused child. Now there's also certain environments that add to the likelihood. Uh, a situation where there's chronic stress, which includes um, kids with chronic disabilities. They are more at risk for, for abuse. Uh, if there's divorce, poverty, unemployment going on in the home, poor housing, a parent who's struggling with substance abuse, frequent relocation, so they're moving all the time, they're living in crowded conditions, those are all um, predictors or, or make it more likely that abuse could happen. But it can happen in any socioeconomic status, any um, population, there's no you, just because they don't fit this picture doesn't mean it isn't abuse. Sexual, abu sexual abuse. This is defined as the use, persuasion, or, or coercion of any child to engage in sexually explicit conduct or simulation of such conduct for producing visual depiction of such conduct or of rape, molestation, prostitution, or incest. Now, characteristics of abusers and victims, usually the abuser's male, and usually they know the victim, but it can be anyone, and again, it can be any socioeconomic background. Now, how do we care for a maltreated child? Um, we want to identify these situations as early as possible so we can get the child out, um, you know, before worse things happen. We want to find out the history pertaining to the incident. 
and then find the evidence for the mal the maltreatment that's going on. So find the pattern or the combination of indicators that make us suspicious and then further investigate. So it's not our job to find proof, but anything that comes up that we say, this, the, um, what I'm seeing and the story I'm hearing, those don't match. Or something that arouses our suspicion, we need to investigate further. And usually that means we need CPS to investigate further. It's not our job to find the actual proof. It's our job if it's suspicious to refer it on for further investigation because our goal is to protect the child from further abuse. Now the child is rarely going to want to be removed from the home so we have to do what's in the best interest of the child even if that's not what they're hoping will happen. In California health care workers are mandated reporters which means if we have suspected abuse, we have to report it. We're supposed to call Child Protective Services immediately and submit a written report. I'm quite sure in Fresno County it's within 24 hours. Um, the 36 hours I believe is national, but our local uh, says within 24. If you don't, you can receive a fine or imprisonment. So if a physician should have been able to tell that this child was coming back repeatedly to the office for abuse and never reported it and ends up there's a bad outcome. The state and or the extended family, you know, the grandparents who wanted the child removed from the home and never could get anybody to listen, those people can sue and health care people who should have been able to see the problem will be fined and can even be imprisoned. Now, if you do see something that you feel like this is um, a sign of abuse or ne neglect, at Children's Hospital, what they'd like us to do is first contact the social worker. They want one report sent in from the hospital, not repeated reports. And the social workers, um, they know, you know, they have the number, they know how to fill out the reports. They're going to be able to, t to talk you through it and lead you through it better. If the child tells them the same story, they might just go ahead and do it rather than have you do it. But if you're the only one the child has talked to, they can't call in with hearsay. A student told me that the child said. They can only say, this child told me. And if the child doesn't tell them, then you are going to have to be the one to make the report. But they'll still do it with you and lead you through the steps.